Dr. Williams brilliantly weaves together orthodox theology with practical application, resulting in a work meaty enough for the scholar, yet digestible and building for the everyday Christian goer. This book is an important contribution to the 21st century Christian community. Elder Williams has provided an excellent text that includes research, sermons, and illustrations that are designed to enlighten the mind, while providing further dialogue among those who wish to gain a deeper understanding of the term, the God-man. Dr. J.D. Williams' insightful perspective regarding the revelation of the mystery between God and Christ is a must-read for all in search of more weighty theological enlightenment. Author and pastor, Dr. J.D. Williams presents The God-Man, The Person and the Work of Christ Jesus, available on Amazon, iTunes, and Barnes & Noble. Get your copy today. We invite you to join us for our weekly events. On Mondays at 6.30 p.m., we have our prayer line via conference call. On Wednesdays at 8 p.m., we have our adult Bible study via Zoom. On Thursdays at 7 p.m., we have our men's Bible study via conference call. On Fridays at 7 p.m., we have our children's Bible study via Zoom. And on Saturdays at 10 a.m., we have our women's Bible study via Zoom. All access codes and passcodes are on the screen. We are so glad that you are led to worship with us today. Please like and share our broadcast. who have woke up this morning, who's burnt, who brought ourselves to this worship experience, who are experiencing God on this new day, we ought to just say thank you. Can we just say thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Lord. You've already been welcome on our broadcast. Those of you in the sanctuary, we're glad you're here. We're going to go right into our worship experience. Amen. Um, have your own private devotion as we Prepare to hear a word from the Lord. Prepare to hear the songs of Zion. And prepare, even at this time, um, for God to bless us. Amen. Our scripture reading is coming at this time. And our prayer is coming. And we're going to go right into, we're glad that you tuned in to worship with us. Amen. Amen.
Amen. We thank God for our scripture reading. We ask that you would stand and join us in our morning hymn. Amen. Blessed quietness. I hear some people clapping. Can we all clap together? You at home, clap as well. First one. Joys are flowing like a river since the comforter has come. He abides with us forever. Makes the trusting heart his own. Verse 2. Bringing light and health and gladness all around this heavenly guest. Conquered on leaf, belief in sadness. Change our weariness to rest. Come on, sing blessed. Blessed quietness. Holy quietness, what a sure sin, my soul. When the storm is here, Jesus speaks to me, and the billow cease to roll. Verse 3, like the rain that falls from heaven, like the sunlight from the sky. To the Holy Spirit's given, coming on us from on high. What a wonder for salvation when we always see His face. What a perfect habitation, what a quiet rest. Sing, place everybody sing blessed blessed quietness holy quietness what a sure on sin my soul on the stormy sea Jesus speaks to me and the billow sees will you just clap your hands everybody come on just clap to the Lord with us. We're glad you're worshiping with us, and we ask at this time that you would follow the instructions on the screen. You are welcome to give and share into the house of the Lord. Amen. We are thankful for his presence. We are thankful for what he's done for us, and we can't repay him for what he's done, but we can give an offering. We can pay our tithes, and we can be a blessing unto the house of the Lord. Can somebody say Amen. Amen. So we do compel you. Um, this is good ground that you can sow on. This is great ground that you can be a part of. And we do compel you at this time um, to be a blessing of the Lord. We are striving 
to reach you out there to and fro all across this country, all across the world. And we need your help out there to help us get this word out about the gospel of Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So we ask now that you would follow the instructions. Um, you can give electronically. And as, as also, you can also give unto the house of the Lord physically. Amen. We're going to first take up our benevolent offering at this time. This is for those who are in need, um, those who are need help, who they need help from us, they need help from others, may not be fortunate as you are, but we ask that you share in this time, amen, our deacon, um, our deacon steward is going to um, come to you at this time, amen, he will walk around, for those in the sanctuary, for those who are watching us, um, you can give, amen, deacon's going to walk around, amen, for the, for the benevolent, amen, thank you. Thank you so much. At this time, we'll do it that way. Please sow unto the Lord. We want to be a blessing to those who are in need. And God has blessed us to be fortunate enough to help others. Amen. We are doing our best to reach um, far and near through the gospel. And we invite you at this time to be a blessing to us. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. At this time, you have an opportunity to give in your tithes and your offering. Um, whatever God has allowed you um, to have as income, he asked for 10%. Amen. Uncle Sam takes theirs, but God asks you to give it cheerfully. Somebody say amen. We do ask that you give. Um, on today, we are approaching the summertime and we have some plans to reach um, do some things in this community do some things in our church and we want you to help us amen so at this time our tithers can come to this side to my left if you're watching at home you can pay your tithes electronically all tithers stand at this time and come to my left if you don't mind thank you so much amen the lord loves a cheerful giver Thank you so much. He is a good God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He has done great things. He has done great things. I mean, they're giving all over the sanctuary. Blessings be unto you. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. We're preparing to hear a word from the Lord. Amen. But before we do, we want to take up our, tithe, our offering at this time. Those who want to give unto the Lord an offering, amen. Our deacon, Stuart, will walk around and collect that. And we will pray when he's done. Thank you so much. Those who want to give in our offering, this is your time. He has done great things, mighty things, and we could never repay him. Amen. Come on, that's right. He has done great things. And we could never repay him for all that he has done. What a mighty God we truly serve. Amen. He is great, and he is greatly to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the saint, he is truly worthy to be praised. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We ask that to bless it. In Jesus' name, multiply it. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to have our moment in black history. Amen. Good morning to the church. As we continue in our reflections of black history, today we present to you Judge Jane Bolin. Jane Bolin became the first black woman to break down many barriers during her life. However, the title for which she holds the most recognition is that of first black woman judge in the country. Using her position from the bench as a family court judge, Bolin fought against racial discrimination within the system and was a fierce advocate for children, particularly children of color, whose cases she oversaw. Bolin's story of legal service and general activism begins at home. Born on April 11, 1908 in Poughkeepsie, New York, 
Her father, Gail C. Bowen, was the first black graduate of Williams College and had his own legal practice. Bowen was also the founding member of the local NAACP and later in life became the first black president of the Dutchess County Bar Association. According to the New York Times, Bowen fell in love with her father's leather-bound law books and decided to do her part as she became more and more aware of the articles and pictures of lynching that she saw published in the NAACP's official publication, Crisis. Bowlin would go on to continue her studies at Wellesley College, the prestigious private women's liberal arts college in Massachusetts. She was one of two black freshmen attending the school where racism was so rampant and they were so ostracized that the two of them opted to move off campus. Despite the trials that Bowlin faced, she graduated in 1928 as one of the top students and was named a Wellesley Scholar. Even though Wellesley acknowledged her brilliance as a student, when she spoke to a guidance counselor at the school about a possible law career, she was told that there were little opportunity for women in law and absolutely none for a colored one. Even her own father discovered the notion at first, according to the Times, although he emphasized that lawyers had to grapple with the most unpleasant and sometimes grossest kind of human behavior. However, once he saw that his daughter's mind was made up, the older Bolin would throw his financial and moral support behind her and help her accomplish her goals. Jane Bolin would be accepted into Yale Law School when she would ultimately become the first black woman to earn her law degree from the esteemed institution. She would later become the first black woman to join the New York City Bar Association. After her graduation, Bolin apprenticed in her father's law office. Dismissed by local law firms due to her gender and most likely her race, she later went on to practice law with her first husband, Ralph E. Mizell. He later died in 1943. Not giving up on her goals, in 1937, Bolin would be appointed Assistant Corporation Counsel of the City of New York also breaking the ceiling as the first black woman attorney hired by that office. Two years later, in a ceremony at the World's Fair, which had just opened, she would be appointed and sworn in as a judge of the Domestic Relations Court, now called Family Court, by the then New York City Mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, sealing her title as the first black judge. As a judge, Bolin led the charge and change of breaking down racial barriers and segregation within the city she was, the system she was a part of. She led the charge of requiring childcare agencies that got public funding to accept children regardless of their race or ethnicity. She also ended the practice of assigning probation officers based on race or religion. Judge Bolin would be appointed to her seat three more times by three more mayors for three more 10-year terms. She only stepped down from her bench when she reached the mandatory retirement age of 70, and that was in 1978. And she wasn't too happy about it either. She quit. They're kicking me out. Still, even after retiring at the age of 70, Bolin continued to advocate for children's rights and education. She volunteered as a tutor in the New York City Public Schools for about two years post-retirement and ultimately went on to serve on the New York State Board of Regents. When she died on January 8, 2007, at the age of 98, she left behind a legacy of a fierce advocate. The New York native defied the status quo and the expectations of those around her and paved her own path along with a clear path for others. Today we recognize Judge Jane Bowen. Amen, can we begin to worship the Lord, hallelujah. Can we begin to worship him, hallelujah. He's worthy of the praise and the glory. We thank him and we bless him. He's a mighty God. 
He's an amazing God. If you will, just stand on your feet in the sanctuary and worship him. Those of you that are at home, begin to worship him. We're going to declare this morning, Lord, you are mighty. You're awesome. You're magnificent. We worship you and we bless your name. Hallelujah. Just lift your voice and bless his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's declare it. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Lord, you said your glory above the heavens and the earth. We worship you. When I think of all you made, the sun, the moon, and the stars, no praise is high enough to Your name, we praise your name. You're so wonderful, oh God. You're worthy of the praise. Oh Lord, you're mighty. Oh Lord, you're mighty. One more time, let's lift them up. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We bless you. You said your glory above. Lord, we bless your holy name. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, 
cloudy drizzly morning but the Lord is good and guess what the sun is still shining <laughs> behind behind the clouds the sun shines I want to continue preaching this morning <clears throat> on this grand and glorious doctrine of the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Um, we're in a postmodern age that has put the church in a danger in terms of doctrine and orthodox theology and belief. As soon as this virus close, uh, come to a close, um, I'm sure the watchtower people will be back out on the streets selling their magazines and other isms will be passing out their heretical literature. I was talking to a pastor the other day and there's such a great need for the church to be on the defense and rightly divide the word of God from a strong orthodox biblical perspective because there's so much as I said that's going on and it's attacking the church and actually when this COVID-9 is ceased or under control when we all get back together, the church would never be the same. Never be the same. Our, our, our um, paradigm is going to have to change in terms of outreach and in terms of ministry. And God has done this. And those who don't understand this is going to miss great opportunities that's coming forth. So let me continue this um, argument um, I want to suggest, and I think some of you may have this book, Frank Moore, 
He's the author of Coffee Shop. Coffee Shop Theology. It's a very easy read, yet it's very informative. Moore says that doubters throughout church history have denied the deity of Christ Jesus. The mystery defies human reasoning that God could come as a man and yet remain God. Our brains cannot uh, fully comprehend a hypostatic union of both God and man in the one person, Jesus the Christ. And so to react to this uh, in their own feeble theology, some have said that Jesus was just an ordinary man with unusual intelligence and understanding. Others have said Jesus could not be divine because that would divide God into two beings. They teach Jesus was a created being just as angels and all living things on the earth. Thus, there was a time when they teach Jesus did not exist. I want to look at these denials further, and then I want to attack them. Jesus, some teach, was not God. Jesus was a created God. Jesus is God, but less than God. Jesus was just a man like any other man. Jesus is, his atonement is not necessary because there's no such thing as sin. Jesus was not raised bodily from the dead. Jesus is not the only way to God. And there goes the list of heretical teaching goes on, false teaching on and on about Jesus. As I prepared to come to church this morning, it came to my mind, is this a relevant sermon in this postmodern day when all other stuff and socialisms and stuff is being preached? And I said, yes, it's relevant. Because when I read, and you can put this down, I didn't give you this note, but if you can find it right quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we will begin at verse 12, if we can get it. If not, you turn with me in your Bibles if you brought them. I always come to church with your Bible, get you an app on your iPhone. Now, if Christ is not preached, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty also. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, faith is futile. 
you are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If Christ be not raised from the dead, if Christ be not preached with boldness and enthusiasm, if the believers of this postmodern age do not believe in the risen, resurrected Christ and do not bow down to his sovereign authority, then we might as well just close up the church and have this as some kind of banquet hall or recreation center. And I want to tell you, beware in this postmodern age of churches that are preaching a Christless doctrine, teaching and preaching a Christless gospel that is absent, absent from the salvific cross work of Jesus Christ. I guess I am not invited to ecumenical gatherings to pray because I'm going to end my prayer in the name in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Christ. For at his name, I believe that because the Bible says it. Every knee will bow in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. At his name, every tongue will confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And St. Augustine, a great black theologian in the third century, I believe, out of North Africa, said this. Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. If Christ is not above all, then he is not valued at all. He does not stand along Buddha, Confucius, Mohammed, or any other religious leader. Christ stands by himself. Uh, Peter and John and James went up to what we call the mountain of transfiguration and um, Jesus was transfigured in, before their very eyes and a, there appeared Moses and Elijah and Moses is the star of the Torah for giving the law and uh, Elijah is the dean among prophets and Peter, James, and John had had conflict in terms of who the heroes were in the um, Tanakh, the Old Testament. So God allows the two of the Old Testament to appear with Jesus. So in case there was any um, conflict about who's the best if you let me put it that way Jesus stands and both of them on either side a cloud comes and God takes them away and the only person standing is Jesus and God the Father confirms and affirms the deity of Jesus by saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I gave Moses the law, but what the law couldn't do, Christ has done. I gave Elijah the prophecies and the other prophets that came after him, but they all pointed to Jesus. And beloveds, I want to tell you, uh, Jesus must be the center, center of your teaching, center of your preaching. He must be the center of 
everything. Do I have a witness? We have a candidate that's going to speak in a few minutes, of running for city controller. But uh, I got some news to tell you. If anybody going to control the city, it's going to be Jesus. He's on the throne, and throughout this sanctuary, we see the banners, Yahshua reigns. He reigns ab above all. Can I get a witness in this house? Um, another writer wrote once, in terms of rebuttal against unorthodox uh, denials, the writer wrote that Jesus is the best picture ever taken. And uh, you, 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 can, you can see the identity of Jesus the Son and God the Father in John 10 and 30. Jesus says, when you see me, you see God the Father because I and the Father are one. And y'all know the word I've shared with you before, homoousios. Same in substance and divinity. Uh, the same with the Father, the same with the Son. Father, Son are one. That's a mystery because we cannot, we cannot fathom, we cannot figure out how God the Father and God the Son are one and yet God the Son comes here. That's, that's, that demands blind faith. That demands that we take the theology as it is and not try to rationalize it or be philosophical or what have you. That demands that the Bible is what the Bible says. Amen. And that it is the inerrant word of God. Let me just put this remark in from my book on page 20, The God-Man. Christ became the God-man for the purpose of procuring or obtaining salvific relation a redemption through a substitutionary atonement for fallen humanity. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, 1 Peter 2 and 24, Ephesians 1 and 7. When you read 2 Corinthians uh, 5 and 21. Can we put that on the board, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21? It reads, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Let me give it to you in a more theological sense. The impeccable Christ, sinless, holy, to the extreme, the impeccable Christ was covered with your peccability, your sins. So in his atonement at the cross, you by faith may become Positionally impeccable. It doesn't always look like we are impeccable. But positionally in Christ we are. God sees the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And you know, beloved, at the cross and the confirmation of this is in Romans 6, verse 5, 6, and 7. Since we have been united with Christ in his death, we also will be raised as he was. Our old sin selves were crucified with Christ so that the sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. For we, when we died with Christ, we were set free 
from the power of sin. And I must tell you, beloveds, that any of us that are saved sin, we sin because we want to, not because we have to. I'm not, well, let me make, let me de define that. Any believer, true believer in Christ, when you sin, you sin because you want to, not because you have to. When you were a sinner apart from Christ, you sinned because you had to sin. That was your sin nature. That was your demeanor. That was your paradigm. That was your behavior. That was your life. But now that you've come to Christ and God has imputed the righteousness of Jesus on you and now indwells in you, you if you sin, you sin because you want to sin, not because you have to sin. And I wish I had somebody in here that would just raise your hand and holler out, I'm free from sin. Don't always act like it. Don't always talk like it. But I am free from sin. And you know what, beloveds? The closer you get to holiness, the more you pursue holiness that God will get the glory the more you will have to fight against the enemy. If your life ain't full of warfare, Lord, help me today. If your life is not full of satanic attacks, Lord, help me today. If your life is not filled with trial and tribulation, because you're, you are living for Christ and pursuing holiness, then I want to tell you, you're still in your sins. If you are comfortable with any kind of sin you are living and committing and your conscience does not bother you and you're not convicted, I came to tell you whether you are a member of the church or not, you're still in your sins. Because if the Holy Ghost indwells in you, he's not only there to glorify Christ through you, but he indwells to convict you of your sin. And beloveds, please hear me. There's not a sin that Christ Jesus' blood has not freed you from. But I'm addicted. You still can be free. I'm a druggie, I'm a drunkard, I'm a hoe, I'm a homosexual, I'm whatever, I'm a liar, I'm a cheater, I'm foolish thinking. If you come to Christ by faith and repentance and fight at the cross, you, you don't get this overnight. You have a few days walking in victory, but I want to tell you, don't let your guard down because the devil is somewhere behind the scenes waiting to bring you. You do know he said, Jesus said the devil comes to steal and to kill. But I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And if you are not saved, I want to tell you, you're a dead man. You're walking a dead man in sin and in trespasses. Hallelujah. But if you're in Christ, you've been delivered. Now this growing, I, I, I talked to a pastor the other day and God bless his heart. He just got sanctification all messed up. He just jacked it all up, and I didn't say nothing because I didn't feel like arguing, and I wanted to take me an afternoon nap after I did my morning study. But he seems to think that sanctification just involves growing in holiness. 
And that's it. Sanctification is when God, through his spirit, regenerates you to come to Christ. And then God sets you aside. Why? He sets you aside so that you can grow in sanctification. Y'all yeah. not hearing me. See, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to make it to heaven. I'm already in heaven positionally because I'm already impeccable in Christ. I've been set aside to grow and what I've been set aside to grow in. Lord, help these people. I've been set aside to give glory to Jesus Christ. But I don't always give glory. And so you know what God has to do? Whom God loves, he chastises. Now, if you ain't never been chastised for the mess you done did, you better go back again because God will chastise his people and it is God's work of glory, glorifying us, preparing us for glorification. Now let me get to my scriptures and I shall sit down. And let me put a footnote here. Some people run from church to church. To when I got my, they got more holiness, Holy Ghost, and <laughs> what a shame! You're gonna be running, and and there are people in church, Lord help my unbelief, that are looking for a perfect church, and the moment they see a flaw, they are ready to give up and go someplace else. Well, let me help you on this. I, I, if you're looking for someone, I'm perfect positionally, but if you're looking for a perfect pastor, I ain't the one. So I, I, I release you today. You can go find someplace else. And if you're looking for perfect musicians and perfect singers and perfect singers and perfect people, we ain't the one. And if you really want no truth, you ain't either. And if you go to a perfect church where there is no perfect church, you're going to make it an imperfect church because of your self-righteous attitude. Lord, I wish I had a hand clap right there. Am I preaching to anybody? I wish I had 10 people that would raise your hand and holler, Lord, help my unbelief. Because I don't want to point them to me or to you. Point them to Jesus who is the author and finisher of your faith. Do I have a witness here? So how do we know that Jesus is the son of God? Well, let me give you a scripture. Romans 1 and 4. The son of God. God, he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The cross did not necessarily declare him as son of God. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The cross is between an empty manger and an empty tomb. The cross is in the middle because the manger brought forth or was all in the manger the God man. The God-man came to down the cross. But had he not got up from the cross, we still would be lost in sin. And I'm glad the tomb is... Listen. Don't you all know that if Jesus really didn't rise, 
Don't you know the world would have found his body? They would have. They'd have been looking. They, they, they know where Buddha is. They know where Confucius is. They know where Muhammad is. But ain't nobody found Jesus Christ because he is not here. He's risen. Oh my God, my God. God said, you want to know whether Jesus is the son of God? The resurrection declares that announces that Jesus is the son of the living God. He was raised with holiness. Oh God, I'm feeling a little more excited now and I'm almost finished. But guess what? How many of y'all in here saved? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're saved. You don't, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Listen, if you say the spirit of holiness that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you. You ought to give God a hand on that. This is why a whole lot of things could have happened to you that didn't happen because God blocked it. Because your name is written. You got a new citizenship. Do I have a witness? And even when God allows the devil to dig a ditch for you to fall, don't panic, don't have a heart attack because you're coming out because all things work together for those who love the Lord to those who are called According to his purpose, you catching hell right now. But tell him that ain't the end of the chapter. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm catching it, I'm going through. But that's not the end because if you would turn with me to the next chapter, it says it works together for my good. Yes, Lord. I wish you would holler at somebody and tell them it's working out for my good. I, I wish you'd quit getting all broke down every time something happens to you. I wish you would holler out it's working for my good. Even if I don't get what I want, if I'm in Christ, it's working for my good. And then when I read Romans 14 and 9, it says, for to this end, Christ died. For the ungodly, give me some help back there, give me some help. 14 and 9, he rose and lives again, that he might be sovereign. That Lord there in the Greek means that is, he's sovereign. Both the dead and the living. Oh, beloved. He's sovereign over death. Sovereign over life. Because he rose from the grave. Yeah. And we read in Romans 5, 4 and 25. Who was delivered up for our offenses. And raised because of our justification. Now that word justification in the Greek is dikaio sune. It means I'm in right standing. And it means that I don't have to go to a priest. 
and go in a box and make confession. If you say, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I can go straight to the throne of God. Do I have a witness? And, and, uh, yeah. and, and when I uh, get into the throne room, I don't have to call him father. Yes, I do. Y'all, some of y'all said yes. I can call him father. Not your honor. Not your judgeship. But I can call him father. Tell your neighbor because I'm in the family. And because I'm in the family, I can say our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And here's our security. We have a savior, a risen savior that sits at the right hand of God. And he makes intercessions for us. If you wanna activate the name of Jesus, I want you as I close, think about something that you've been dealing with. And you're almost tired of dealing with it. And I dare you to get on your feet and holler, Jesus. And the moment you get on your feet and holler, Jesus. Jesus intercedes for you. Jesus is right by the right hand of the Father. And tell your neighbor, neighbor, I've got good protection because my Savior is on the throne. My Father is on the throne. And when I call the name Jesus, my Savior intercedes for me. Do I have a witness? Well, thank you for letting me preach to y'all this, this day. But I trust in God. Wherever I be, out on, <laughs> yeah, Lord, the ocean of stormy sea, come with me from day to day. Look at somebody and tell them, my heavenly Father watches over me. Anybody here? know who woke you up this morning? Is there anybody here that knows that he guides your feet and he holds your hand? I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives. He lives. He lives within my soul. Yes! That's all I got today. That's all I have. But I can tell you as I close that I know he's all right. He's all right. But I done gave you enough that y'all can leave out of here and face another week. 
Vernice, we can make it another week. The sister that's sitting next to you, can you just stand up, Vernice, and hunt her with your elbow? Can you just hunt somebody? Y'all, y'all find somebody to hunt and tell them I can make it <laughs> another week. But I know it's been hard on somebody because I can feel a burden in your spirit. But don't you leave the same way you came in. You leave out here knowing that you're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ and nothing shall be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Don't you leave with your head bowed down. But you leave out of here saying, I can do all, all, all things through Christ that strengthens me. Do I have a witness? Don't you leave out of here lost, wondering which way to go? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me don't you leave deep down in the valley because you can lift up your head from whence cometh your help your help comes from the Lord that made the heaven and the earth don't you leave scared in the presence of your enemies because when you're in the presence of your enemies he will anoint your head with oil Till your cup runs over do I have a witness don't you leave worrying about trouble because he will he will he will he will give you peace in the won't he do it Do it. Wave your hand and say yes. Talk about Jesus. This is what they used to sing in Tennessee. Y'all don't know nothing about that. He's a friend of mine. Ooh. Talk about Jesus. He's a friend of mine. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, shall not want. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. And I 
I'm on my way to heaven in Jesus' name, The doors of the church are open. If you're listening through the camera and the Lord has touched you and you feel led, give us your name, your phone number, and how we can contact you. And just state right now, I confess Christ. And if there's someone in this room that's not saved, I bid you come down and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I hear sometimes people say, make Jesus your choice. Well, if he's made you your choice, if he chose you, then you're going to make him his choice, your choice for him. Is there one? If you're talking about Jesus. If you're talking about Jesus, if you're talking about Jesus, he's a friend of mine. If you're talking about Jesus, Is there one? If you're talking about Jesus, he's a friend. Oh, my. If I couldn't say a word. 